Hello. It's good to see you all. This is um, a story uh, about the work that I do and about my family and how they collided and changed one another, really. So there we are. This is me. And this is my son, Jonathan. And if, to start at the beginning, it's also an ending as well. And uh, my wife, Lisa, was in hospital for a routine checkup and appointment. And uh, she was pregnant at the time. And I was at home with my daughter, Catherine, who had the flu. And uh, we were feeling pretty rough. But uh, the phone rang. Catherine ran and got the phone for me. And it was a midwife. And she told me that we had twins, which was, I thought, was great. Twins. I'd kind of been hoping it might be twins. And then she said, but. And she told me that one of the twins had a problem, that my wife was very distressed, and that I should come up to the hospital as quickly as we could. So Catherine and I got a taxi, and we, got a, we took a journey to the hospital. And on the way, I thought about all the things that might be happening with, with these children of mine. I wondered about whether there might be disabilities or, or what the situation might be. And I decided on the way to the hospital that whatever happened, that I would love these children, and that I would be their father, and that I would stick with them. And we got to the hospital, and I was met by a consultant there, and he took me down the corridors. And on the way, he explained that one of the twins had a condition called anencephaly, which is a severe form of spina bifida, and it means that most of the child, the top of the child's skull, doesn't form properly, and that uh, this child would die. And I dropped at that moment into my kind of professional mode. My, my Tim, the engineer who works in hospitals, switched on, and I began to ask the consultant and talk to him, and we were with Lisa by this time, ask him lots of questions. I had a short time to find out as much information as I could. We went home. We were sh I was quite shocked. We both were. The diagnosis was confirmed on the Monday. And on the Tuesday morning following, I, I paused. I didn't go to work quite as quickly as I might have. And I sat and thought about what had happened and what was going to happen. And uh, about, my so about my child, um, who, who I was not sure whether even he might be a person or not. He would probably have very little brain, but he was a very active boy in his mother's room. He was very busy. And uh, I decided that, uh, that he was my son, that I would love him, and decided to call him David, which means beloved. Forty days later, Lisa's labour started, and uh, 112 days early, uh, Jonathan, well, David was born in the hospital. He lived perhaps 20 minutes, and then he died quietly in my arms. And it's very hard to tell exactly how long it was. But a very short time after that, Jonathan was born, and immediately the medical staff took him and resuscitated him. He wasn't breathing, and uh, took him away to the neonatal intensive care unit. And Lisa and I then had a couple of hours of quiet time with David. <coughs> This is David here. I, I am a father, and I'm a chartered engineer. I'm a husband, and I'm a clinical scientist. I have a disabled son, and I work with disabled children. I work with people with dementia, and my father-in-law also had dementia. And on this day, in these two worlds of home, of family, and of work, and professional expertise collided and came together, and they both changed one another, and they both changed me. We went back to the hospital, um, when we were in the hospital, we went back to, uh, to see Jonathan in the neonatal unit. And uh, when I walked into this room, it was technology heaven. The, the engineer in me thought, wow, what an amazing place. I've never been here before. Look at all this stuff. I want to know how that works and that works. And the staff were only too glad to explain it all to me. But there in the corner, just by the door on the left-hand side, was my little baby boy, my little son, who was no bigger than my, my daughter's favourite doll. In fact, her doll's clothes were a bit too big for him at that stage. And so, so began a journey as, we, as I began to discover what, what I was going to learn from him, what he would teach me, and how my work life would, would change as a result. This is us in, in the hospital. We were a family there together, but it, and it was a different experience for each of us. OK. Welcome to the kitchen for a change of tone. I want to take you to my kitchen at home. This is my kitchen. This is my chopping board. This is my favourite cooking knife and my mortar and pestle. And these are things which are really important to me. I love to, knowing how to use a knife properly, how to make it sharp and work properly. I love knowing how to use the mortar and pestle to grind up my spices. And I have lots of electric gadgets in my kitchen, but they just sit in the cupboards and I never use them really. Because for me, being able to do these things and use these things is really important. And I, I love being able to, to know how, how to do that. For me, 
being quick and easy isn't the most important thing. I don't want my kitchen life to be quick and easy. I want my kitchen life to reflect who I am, to be creative. It connects me with people when I cook food, which they like most of the time. My children might disagree with me occasionally. But these things are important to me and they represent who I am. The way that I do and what I do and when I cook food is, is about being who I am. Kitchen knives are sharp. They're not always safe, but they're important to me. Part of my work is, um, well, all of my work is at Bath Institute of Medical Engineering. And, well, I, and there I am an engineer, and I started working there in 1996, no, quite some time ago, designing assistive technology for people with disabilities, trying to make life easier, trying to make life safer for people with disabilities. And a lot of my work focused on that kind of thing. This here is a, is a, um, a, a kitchen from a smart apartment that we designed for people with dementia. But as time has gone by, I've realised that actually safer and easier aren't the things that we always want. We don't always want to be safe and easy. What we do want is to be connected with the people that we love and care about. What we do want is to be able to express ourselves and do the things that are important to us. And these should be the priorities for my work, not just safe and easy. So, back to the kitchen. Here we are. Here's my cooking knife and here's my mortar and pestle. And these things, I, I wonder... My, Am, am I disabled, perhaps? And there are lots of disabled people in this room today. I see quite a few of you are wearing glasses and you're using assistive technology to help you see. But I wonder, I think this category of assistive technology is a bit meaningless because my hand isn't sharp, unfortunately. It, I can't cut tomatoes with my hand. I need a sharp knife to do that. And so um, perhaps you might say that I'm disabled in some way and that I have to use this knife as technology. This knife is assistive technology to me. Um, some people can't walk because for whatever reason their legs don't work properly or whatever, and they use a wheelchair, and that wheelchair is assistive technology to them. In fact, all technology is assistive technology because it's all there to do things and help us to do things that we can't otherwise do. So I think the, word, the, the phrase of assistive technology is in some ways perhaps a bit meaningless. There is no difference between the technology and its purpose for what a disabled person is using and what all of us use. It's the same thing. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the work that I'm doing. And we're going to talk now and look, about, look at uh, some work that I was doing for people with dementia. This man here um, is the proud owner of his cooker, which I, if you look carefully at the cooker knobs on the right-hand side, he's, he has adapted. Um, and uh, well, no, Sorry, I adapted for him, but he has been using um, with his wife. And for him, uh, his wife had dementia, and it meant she um, couldn't cook safely in the kitchen because she would forget to leave the gas on sometimes, and this was a big problem. But with a cooker monitor that I designed, we were able to make his kitchen much safer. This had several good outcomes for him and his wife. For him, it meant he could go to the bowls club where he always used to go, and he could go and spend some time with his friends, he could keep up those really important social connections and social support that he had, and still be the person that he wanted to be at the bowls club. And for his wife, it meant that she could stay at home and cook the Sunday lunch like she really enjoyed doing, and as she had always done. And when I went to talk to this couple, after they'd had the cooker monitor for a little while, about, about what it did for them, they didn't tell me, oh, it makes us safe now, or, or it makes things life so much easier. What they told me about was being able to go to the bowling club and being able to do the cooking. And it was these things that were important to them. And this made me think about what is the aim of my engineering? It's not to make things safe or easy or less complicated. It's to enable people to be connected to one another. It's to enable people to do the things that are important to them and that express who they are. Now, this is a photograph from another smart flat where I was doing some work. And the man that lived here was named Victor. Victor used to be a telephone engineer. And uh, he tested the smart flat for us. He also used to go to the day centre, uh, a place for you know, older people to do various activities near where he lived. Um, and uh, the people at the day centre said, oh, you know, Victor's, Victor's quite quiet. He doesn't do much. He dozes for a lot of the day. Um, it's his dementia, you know, it's just what he's like. But with our sensors and the systems that we had installed in the flat, we realised that, in fact, Victor was hardly getting any sleep at all. He was getting up at night, he was walking around and not really sleeping properly. And perhaps this was why he was not very engaged and active in the day centre. Well, with our smart flat system, we were able to use some lighting to help him find the toilet. And what we realised was Victor wasn't just wandering around because of his dementia. He was trying to find the toilet at night. And when our lighting showed him where the toilet was, he got up, he went to the toilet, he went back to bed and went back to sleep again. This was great. 
The day centre staff, who didn't know about our smart flat, all the details of it, were amazed. Victor's so much different now. He joins in with all the activities, and he does this and does that. And Victor had come alive. And that he was transformed because we had taken the care to understand who Victor was and what he was doing and how his life worked. And not a, just put it down to his dementia, it's just what he's got. Victor was a person, again. When Victor was in hospital near the very end of his life, he said to his daughter, who came to visit him, he said, tell Tim that the sensors under the bed don't work properly and that uh, he needs to go and sort the lights out because, you know, they, they don't work. And uh, when Kim told me this, I was amazed. I, Victor had very severe, well, not very severe dementia. Victor had quite, quite moderate dementia, which meant that he couldn't really remember the end of a conversation from the beginning or the end of a sentence even from the beginning. But he remembered all these things. In that, in that request about the technology, about me, about what was supposed to happen about his flat. And it made me think too, that I shouldn't make assumptions about what people remember or about what people can do. On that day, Victor was being a helpful engineering colleague, helping out another person with a problem, a technical problem that I had. And I really appreciated that from him. Okay, engineering freedom. This is about, I'll tell you, I'll tell you quickly first a little bit about Jonathan. Here he is. Jonathan is an interesting boy. He's my, he's my best son, as I call him. And Jonathan likes to be able to do everything that he tries to do. This is Jonathan when he was two on his roller skates. Now, when Jonathan was also two, we took him to the John Radcliffe Hospital for a long assessment for a whole week to find out all the things that were wrong with Jonathan. We found out, among other things, that he had cerebral palsy. He had a taxic cerebral palsy, which means that his coordination and his balance aren't so good and he has problems with those kind of things. It means he falls over a lot, um, but this doesn't put Jonathan off. He likes to use his roller skates anyway. So in my work, I have been designing seats for children with very severe cerebral palsy. And this was my first attempt. These are children who have whole body spasms that make them do this kind of movement. They have them frequently, have them throughout the day. It can be often for some children if they're distressed or excited, perhaps every two seconds. This one didn't work. But the next time, I went and watched a mother holding her child, and the way she supported him, and the way she allowed him to move, and the support and the stability that she gave him, whilst not fixing him down and letting him move, was what I wanted to do for my seat design. Because this was enabling the child to, be, to do all that he was able to do. If, if he had a seat, then he would, be able to, he would be able to move and do those things without having to be held by his mother. And this is the, de the design, the support that we used. And here's the seat that we built. And when we tested this seat with this child, he sat in the seat for six weeks in his school, and he used it for perhaps three or four hours every day. And what we found was, his, his teacher told me about this, was that he was much more verbal and uh, much more vocal in his classroom lessons. That wasn't something we'd expected to happen from a seat. But he could move now. He could move his legs and his arms, and he was mobile, and he was joining in more. She also told me that the other staff were noticing him more and engaging with him more and doing more with him and involving him more. So it wasn't just him that was being affected by this seat technology, it was the staff in the school as well. And when, when we went back to visit him at the end of the six week period, we found that he could operate a seat, operate a switch that he hadn't been able to operate before. And his rigid seat, which constrained him and fixed him down, he was stable, but he couldn't do much. He couldn't really do anything at all, but in this seat, he could operate a switch, and if you can operate a switch, there are lots and lots of things you can attach to that switch. And what we found with this was, what I thought about was, why am I doing this engineering? This isn't to enable a child to move or to sit comfortably, although that was one of my aims. What I want to do with this engineering, and what's important, is that this child is involved in his classroom, that he can do things with his friends, that he's able to go places, that he's able to be all that he, all that he is and all that he can be. I needed to change my thinking not to be about um, this disabled child that I see in front of me, but to think about what this child might be and not to place limitations in my mind on what that child might be like in the future. Okay, let's just come back to Jonathan again. Jonathan is a, a wonderful boy, in my opinion, being his father, <laughs> because he's very determined, he's very, he perseveres, and he doesn't let things, he doesn't give up on things easily. This does mean that he falls over quite a lot. When we took Jonathan to his first preschool, we went to see his teachers in the preschool and we talked to them and said, please let Jonathan fall over because he loves to run around, he loves to do things and he's quite happy to fall over and get up again and we don't think that he needs to be so safe 
that he can't do these things. It's more important for Jonathan that he's able to run around and join in with his classmates and, join and do the activities than it is that he doesn't fall over and bruise his knees and uh, scrape his shins. And he still does bruise his knees and still does scrape his shins. But he's involved and he's engaged. It means that he's now, he's learned to walk and he's learned to run and he's getting pretty good at riding his bike as well. And all the, I never imagined when Jonathan was born that, and we found out about his disability that he might be riding a bike. But Jonathan's proved me wrong in this. And he's, he, he has changed the way I think about the children and the adults that I work with. And he's changed my expectations. And I lift my expectations now. I hope for the best. I am, I am realistic about the disabilities that people have. And I know the consequences and the severity of some of the problems that many people face. But I shouldn't ever just assume that people can't do things, because sometimes they can. And sometimes we need to take some risks to let people be who they are and who they can be. Let me show you one more little video. This is Jonathan when he was born. Oh, and shortly after he was born, he was a tiny, helpless baby who needed everything doing for him, even breathing. This is Jonathan today, just, just over the new year, on the, running on the beach in West Wales. And this is Jonathan not very long ago. Yes, yeah, sure.